Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian in Arlington, Virginia. We recently conducted a wide-ranging exit interview with Air Force Lieutenant General Chris Bogdan, the outgoing program executive officer of the F-35 Lightning II pro fighter program. I asked him to explain the operational lessons learned gained from jets that are already in the field. Let me take you to operational lessons learned. Uh, aircraft is now operational, uh, declared operational IOC. The Marine Corps was the first one to do that, followed by the United States Air Force. Uh, Navy is still working on that in terms of getting the full IOC declaration on it. Um, what are some of the operational lessons learned? You know, you have some aircraft that are in the UK. You have an aircraft, uh, the Jap uh, the uh, excuse me, the Marine Corps aircraft are at Iwakuni now. What are some of the lessons learned you're you're picking up when these aircraft are making it out there into the field? Yeah. including in Europe where you're having uh, a deployment as well. Right. We, we have airplanes now um, either deploying or located all over the world. We've got a unit of the U.S. Marine Corps permanently stationed in Iwakuni, as you said. Uh, we have the Israelis who have five airplanes uh, in Israel flying operationally today. Uh, we have three airplanes in Italy. Uh, we just came back from a U.S. Air Force deployment in Europe. Um, and and one, of the, one of the main things we're learning is that this airplane, from a capability standpoint, is a game changer. Uh, in, in all of those deployments and exercises that we've um, participated in, um, un unanimously what folks are coming back, both the fourth generation airplanes and the folks that are flying the F-35, is that this is creating a different way of fighting an air war. And, and what I mean by that is the F-35, um, not only is it really hard to find from its stealth capabilities, it can go very deep into the battle space uh, and survive. And with the combination of its sensors and its fusion capability, provide a very, very clear picture, uh, a very clear situational awareness to the pilot of what's going on in, in the battle space. We can take that information and we can pass it to other platforms and, and, and other folks to make them even smarter. And I think that's the one thing that over the past year and a half, as the airplane's gotten into the hands of the warfighter, and we have 210 airplanes out there in the hands of the warfighter now, we're finding that this airplane is a force multiplier. It can take that picture of the battle space and provide it to fourth generation airplanes and other platforms and make them smarter and make them much more survivable. And, and that's a big deal because that's just more than a fighter airplane. That's an airplane that when you put it in the battle space, everybody's game gets raised. I, I want to take you to the connectivity question because one of the um, challenges with the F-22, for example, was that F-22s talk to F-22s. They don't talk all that well to other things uh, in, the, in the force. And if you talk to the Air Force Chief of Staff, uh, General Goldfein, he's saying that, look, his priority, even in a fiscally constrained or even a fiscally rich environment, is give me more airmen, but also give me a battle network to connect all of the different disparate pieces of my force, legacy as well as future. When you're looking at it, give us the state of you know where we are in terms of the connectivity of the F-35 with the existing force right now. Do you have that degree of connectivity that is integral to this aircraft being a full success? We connect, the F-35 connects with other platforms in basically three ways. We connect classically with our radios um, talking to each other. We connect with Link 16, which is the common network carrier across many of our fourth generation platforms. One of the critiques about the F-22 in the past was it didn't have Link 16, so it couldn't talk to those fourth generation airplanes. With Link 16 on the F-35, you are able to take that picture I was telling you about and pass it to Super Hornets, and pass it to F-16s, and pass it to F-15s um, in, in, a, in an, an environment where it's okay to transmit. Now, if you're in a stealth mode, we have a system on the airplane called MATL. Um, uh, it, it's a data link that's a low probability of intercept data link. Today, that data link is just between common F-35s flying together. But the Navy just did a, a, a demonstration last year where they actually linked up our Mattel F-35 with an Aegis cruiser, and we were and and that Aegis cruiser was able to shoot down a, a low altitude um, near supersonic missile being targeted at the Aegis without the Aegis cruiser ever seeing the missile because of that link with Mattel between the F-35, which could see that target and pass the targeting information to the Aegis cruiser. So what we think is that's a demonstration of the, the unique capability of the F-35. And, and I think what the, the department's going to figure out is the sooner we can both with Link 16 
in a greater degree, and with MATL, the low probability of intercept communication link, link up more platforms. We'll get to that network that, that General Goldfein is looking for, where everyone in the battle space has an equal picture. Even before he was president, Donald Trump uh, started to put some pressure on the F-35 program, uh, said that there should be a competition between a similar, uh, a comparable version of the F-18. Uh, there are a lot of experts who say that there isn't a comparable version of the F-18 extant right now. But talk to us a little bit about the competition between these two aircraft. Um, you know, you were part of those discussions. You were part of those meetings. Talk to us a little bit about what this means, what it does it mean for the program, you know, and what's the business case you're making in this competition for the F-35 to, to win, uh, win the argument at the end of the day? Yeah, first and foremost, I'm not a salesman for the F-35. So um, what the department decides in terms of quantities of their airplanes, um, my job is to just run the best program I can, no matter how many F-35s they choose to buy. But relative to um, the comparison between the F-18 and the F-35, one thing was clear in our conversations with the new administration, as well as within the department um, with uh, some of the new folks coming on, is that you cannot replace an F-35 with even the most advanced version of a Super Hornet when you're at the high-end fight. It just can't, it, it just doesn't work. Um, there's great things you can do to a, a Hornet, a Super Hornet, to make it better, but you can't get it to do the things that the F-35 does today. Everybody realizes that. That's why when people talk about the competition between the Super Hornet and the F-35, um, we all look, including the Navy, and say, we think those airplanes are complementary. They're not in competition with, you, with each other. Um, as I talked about before, how an F-35 can make other airplanes smarter, in the same way a Super Hornet and an F-35 flying together are a very, very viable and a very, very good combination of airplanes. And that's what the Navy's plan has always been over the next two decades, to put on their large deck carriers a combination of advanced Super Hornets and F-35s that could work together um, to bring the fight to the enemy. So when we look at it and when I look at it, I don't look at it as an either or for the Navy. I look at it as how many airplanes can they afford to buy of both. Um, the other thing that was very clear that we made to the administration was even if an advanced Super Hornet was getting to be near on par with an F-35, an advanced Super Hornet can't replace the A model and it cannot replace the B model. It can't replace the A model because the U.S. Air Force is going to buy you know, 1,763 of them, they've never had a Super Hornet in their inventory, and that just doesn't make sense. Uh, for the B model, unless you can build a Super Hornet that can go up and down and, and land vertically on a small deck carrier, it's not going to replace a B model. So everybody is very clear in, in understanding that what we're really talking about is an advanced Super Hornet and that mix of airplanes with an F-35C. And I believe the Navy has been very forthright with the Congress and the administration saying, look, in the future, in the next uh, two decades, we're looking to have two squadrons of F-35s and two squadrons of advanced Super Hornets on the deck at any one time. Now, over time, those Super Hornets, even the advanced versions, are not going to be viable in the next 25, 30, 40 years. So they've got to look at putting more F-35s or maybe even a sixth-generation airplane uh, in, in the future out there. So, so for us, it, it is not a matter of one versus the other, a zero-sum game. It's a matter of if the, if the U.S. government can afford it, the Navy needs tactical fighters, and they'd like to buy both F-35s and advanced Super Hornets. <laughs>